I know we've never been able to take uh, a friend around before. It's uh, very twisting very fast, so you just uh, have to keep working. I don't have any problems operating. It's going to be another hot one. They've made a lot of nicer improvements the same actual course except for the first turn which they straightened out a great deal but they've made they've cut the banks away like in the s's and you can see the course more so now where it used to be blind corners i'd prefer it uh, as it was before where it was just a little tighter through the s's it is a different circuit but i still think that uh, it will always remain riverside it's going to be a tough long grind i'm sure riverside round five of the can-am fast hot and dusty. A Canadian-American Challenge Cup race. The Times Grand Prix at Riverside, California. The Times Grand Prix at Riverside, California. Brought to you by Fram Corporation, maker of the finest in oil, air, and fuel filters. car, by its very nature, should be able to compete on any type of race course. Riverside International Raceway in Southern California's desert country has the widest range of conditions offered by any racing circuit in the United States. A serpentine stretch of essence. An uphill right angle turn. A blind horseshoe curve. button hook that leads into a foot to the floor mile long straightaway. Ending in a brake burning steel walled U-turn. Past the pits and into a cresting left hand bend for another lap. To lap Riverside Raceway at 115 miles an hour or better, you must not only be a fine driver and have a good car, but a crew chief with a space age outlook as well. Do you set up for maximum speed on the straights or do you tune engine and chassis for the turns? Maximum performance at best is a compromise. Well, you have to have it so it goes everywhere because if you have a slow straightaway speed, somebody will drive right by you. We're geared to run about 188 down the back stretch and that's the only place uh, he uses high gear just momentarily over here going into turn three, but uh, turn two. But actually, we try to get it geared everywhere on the racetrack, otherwise we lose ground. Doesn't quite have the torque of some of the other cars coming off the turn, but after you get out on the straightaway and get about halfway down, it comes on quite well. We change the uh, rear end and we have to reset the chassis to uh, accustom this new uh, change we made to the car. So, uh, Parnelli turned the lap 141.4 this morning, and uh, I don't know whether they have it on the time sheet or not, but that's been our fastest lap. We're trying to get them another half a second do that with the eye. Our car in particular, it seems that it is faster through the corners than down the straightaway, but this was something that we built into the car when we were building it. Uh, Riverside, it shows up more than other places because you have this tremendous fast, long straightaway. And our car seems to be better through the corners than down the long straightaway. We're down a little bit on straightaway speed, uh, largely because we're down a little bit on maximum power. Our car is basically not very good aerodynamically. 
It just raised me quick, but it's not as quick as we thought it was going to be, so this is just a matter of shape. Danny, will superior handling of the car enable you to make up for the loss of speed on the straightaway? Yeah, this is basically where we're getting it back, is uh, the short burst in between the short parts of the circuit. Um, this is where we score most. This is a very fast racetrack as far as straightaway is concerned, and it has S's and corners like that, and you have to compromise in between aerodynamics and handling of the automobile. Uh, how have you uh, approached this problem? Well, we have a pretty strong engine, and we've worked our best on the chassis, and we feel everything's a pretty good combination now. Will you be able to out straight away the majority of the cars here? Yes, I believe so. How about coming off the slow corners? Uh, well, we've modified our chassis a little bit from a standard Lola, and it seems to get a lot better traction than a stock Lola machine. It's been standing around for a year. It's last year's car, as you know. And um, we're just sort of getting some of the old age out of it, I suppose. Are you happy with its performance compared with the car you've had in previous Can-Ams? We've got a few little problems on the uh, performance side. The reason we're running last year's car is uh, part of its program to double check things, some of the faults we've had with the other car. And as such, um, it's behaving very well. But uh, handling and things, it's performing very well indeed, really, considering it's a, uh, what, two models back. Mario, the new car seems to be getting better with every race, isn't it? Well, Chris, a lot better. And actually, uh, just like I always said uh, right along, uh, it just needed miles. And it seems like the more miles we put on, the more we learn about it and just do the right things to the chassis to bring it, uh, as they say, in the ballpark. You got a very fast qualifying round, uh, way under the old record, and you're right up front in the starting grid. Do you think that you'll be able to race the McLarens and Hall uh, in the early stages? Well, I think so. Uh, actually, uh, they might be running just a little harder than uh, my car can stand it, uh, so I just fly, probably try to keep them in sight, but uh, if there's any way that I can race them, I will. Group 7 racing in this country has come a long way, and the Can-Am series this year has been very interesting, and you've played an important part in it. But the rivals are getting closer and closer, aren't they? Yes, um, this is something we sort of expected, and um, it hasn't got us too worried, although it keeps us on our feet, try to keep me in front of them. But I think this is a big circuit, where we're going to hurt the most. What about the race? Uh, it's drawing near the close of the Can-Am series. Will there be a team strategy employed by the McLaren team today? Uh, yes. Uh, at the moment, that strategy is to try and beat Gurney. Um, one of us will try and race just as hard as we can go with Gurney, and the other will, uh, will sit pretty much uh, without straining the car more than necessary and try and just stay in uh, within range. The field for the Times Grand Prix is an impressive one. 39 cars will take the flag, and the first 16 of which have cracked the old qualifying record. Pace setter in the time trials was Dan Gurney, a favorite son here in California, with a record 118.7 mile an hour lap. The engine in his Lola, a Ford. And there are three other Ford drivers in the race. Indianapolis winner Parnelli Jones, USAC champion Mario Andretti, and California great Jerry Titus. And they're up against a field that has 30 Chevrolet powered cars, Two Ferraris, two Oldsmobiles, and a lone Repco. Riverside, round five of the Can-Am Challenge Cup Series. Fast, hot, and dusty. Today's chapter about to unfold. Bruce McLaren, race car designer, builder, winner of nearly every major race car event in his class. With over 500 horsepower and speeds of over 170 miles per hour, he wants his car, his engine, equipped with the best of everything. In oil filtration, he insists on Fram and only Fram. The reason? He said it himself. Bearing life on an engine like this is one of the most important things we have to watch, and there, of course, we use Fram filters all the time. That's the only thing for us. Fram is the filtering system for your car, too. The same Fram oil filters used by Bruce McLaren and other race experts the world over will keep the oil in your car's engine just as clean. Effective filtration is keeping dirt outside so that things work better inside. The oil, air, and fuel, the final word in filtration is Fram. Fram filters. They work on the track. They work on the road.
This is Les Kiter, Mike's side, to bring you the 10th annual Times Grand Prix for sports cars. Fifth race in the rich Canadian-American Challenge Cup Series. Fastest qualifier, Dan Gurney, leads Bruce McLaren and Jim Hall from the green flag start. Arnelli Jones gets off quickly, bursting from sixth place in the grid to fourth as they enter turn one. Native Californian Gurney shows the way through the S's, driving the latest version of the English Lola. His Gurney Westlake Ford delivers about 425 horsepower, highest rated in the field. Over the blind horseshoe, it's still Gurney. Behind the leaders are Holm and Andretti. Mark Donahue and teammate Palmer have moved ahead of Surtees and Spence. Through the button hook at turn eight, the field is still tightly bunched. Something has hit Dennis Holm's car. Parnelli Jones, just ahead of Holm, almost drove over the tire markers at the side of the track. On the high-speed back straight, Holm obviously slowed. Andretti in the number 17 Ford Hunker gets by into fifth place. At the completion of lap one, it's still Gurney. The improvements to turn one have cut about two seconds off lap times. It's a wider and less severe bend now. The Times Grand Prix attracts the top drivers in the world of auto racing as well as the fastest sports cars. Arnelli Jones turns it on. He's past Jim Hall. Gurney's dropped to second behind McLaren, and Jones goes deep into turn nine for the lead. These seven sports racers top out at about 195 miles an hour on the mile-long straight. McLaren tries to regain the lead, but Jones out drags him onto the pit straight. Jones is using a Ford engine originally designed for Indianapolis cars, but boosted in horsepower to compete with a bigger Chevy and Ford engine. Dennis Holm is in the pits with part of his fender work missing. Jerry Titus is also in. This is the first try for the Shelby-built King Cobra and for Titus in the fast group seven racing. Pre-race favorite Dan Gurney continues to drop back. Andretti in car number 17 moves into fourth. McLaren tries again, but no goal. Tremendous early race action. The order, Jones, McLaren, Hall, Andretti, and Gurney. Average speed is over 112 miles per hour for three laps, faster than last year's top qualifying speed. Hall is ready to join the fray. His left wheel almost naked of bodywork, however. The pit marshal gives home the wait signal for a clear track but it looks like they're not going to let Holm onto the course. The chief pit marshal is waving Holm out. It's not quite clear on the regulations here, but apparently the officials are disqualifying Holm because of the absence of sufficient bodywork over the wheel. How often have you seen this at a race? Holm wants a clarification of the rules, I'm sure. A tough break for Holm. He won three races thus far in the Can-Am series, and leads in the standings with 27 points. Holm is out of the car and now talking with the chief steward. McLaren team manager Teddy Mayer is getting in there also. But the decision has been made and Holm is out of the race. Water Chris Economaki is in the thick of things. Go ahead, Chris. Teddy, what has happened actually? One of the leading cars threw a tire up in the air and I couldn't avoid it. And just hit the top of the wing and smashed it in. And this, they've knocked you out of the race because of the fender missing? Yeah, apparently. But I, I haven't touched anything. That's what annoys me. It's da they haven't damaged the car structurally or anything. I see. Thank you. Denny Holm, out of the race. Dan Gurney has fallen way back in the field, and the trail of smoke from his engine pretty much tells the story. He's laying a trail of oil also. John Surtees slides off the track at turn one and into the desert. That brief tour in the rough wasteland seems not to have affected the car. Surtees is racing again. Not so for Gurney. His car is quit at turn eight, and hard luck Dan is out of it. 
up ahead at turn nine, Bruce McLaren has regained the point, dropping Jones to second with Hall making a bid for that spot. Hall and the Chaparral apply the pressure, but Jones gamely holds on, sandwiched between the bigger engine cars. Trouble at turn seven. Jim Paul has spun his McLaren Chevy, allowing Bud Morley and Doug Hooper to get by. He's okay, though, and back in it, but well down to the leaders. Andretti is into the pits. Mario had worked his way into fourth place in the first really impressive showing of the Holman and Moody Hunker Ford. He's working the gear lever, which might be the problem. Jim Hall has caught and passed Parnelli Jones. McLaren continues in first, Hall an exhaust fume behind. A year ago at the same race, Hall staged a furious battle with John Surtees before finishing second. And Hall doesn't like to finish second. Watch out, Bruce. And Reddy was plagued by transmission trouble in this morning's practice session, and a failing replacement unit took him only 10 laps. This effort at Riverside, however, looks promising for Ford. That's not California smog, you're saying. It's a desert sandstorm. Winds have kicked up to gusts of 60 miles an hour here at Riverside, obliterating some parts of the course. With Hall applying continual pressure, McLaren has set a tremendous pace, overtaking the slower car. Jones is third now. He's dropped nearly a quarter of a mile back. Trying to get by McCluskey and nudges him a bit in the process. A tangle at turn nine. Jonathan Williams is into the wall. Peter Revson onto the dirt infield. Revson is still under power and is making his way back onto the track. Williams is out of the car and is okay. His Ferrari, one of two entries in Group 7 racing, is severely damaged, however. Revson has made his way to the pits and is limping in on a badly twisted front wheel. The left fender is also torn. With Holmes' disqualification for body removal, Revson's crew will have to patch up the bodywork if he's to continue. And that's just what they're doing. The dirt all over Revson and the car is as much from the windstorm as it is from his off-track excursion. Revson's ready to give it a try. This half has dropped him back to six, moving Motzenbacher and Donahue up. Motzenbacher loses it at turn seven. Donahue trailing right behind, sneaks by and into fourth place. Lothar qualified eighth and has been a consistent driver in all of the Can-Am races. A lot of early race action at the Times Grand Prix. Leader McLaren's race average, 113 miles an hour. Ball is in second, two seconds behind. A driver's view down the long straightaway. Visibility on other parts of the course, worse. Peter Revson is as far as turn seven and moving very slowly. Pit straight and the leaders, McLaren and Hall, pulling away. The rest of the field is no match for this fearsome twosome. Cornelli Jones obviously losing power does his best to hold on to third, with a pass closing Mark Donahue fourth. Mike Spence and a two-year-old McLaren is sixth behind Lothar Motzenbacher. It's all over for Revson and the number 52 Lola as the panic gets another customer. Let's check with Chris Economaki, who's in the pits with Revson. Peter, the wind is blowing and the dust is all over. It must be difficult out there. Yeah, you come into some dust clouds and you're not sure whether there's a car in the middle or not. You know, it's uh, pretty rough because the, the wind, you know, it swirls the dust around a different spot every time you come in, come around the racetrack. What has happened to you? Well, I was coming to turn nine to get a lap in one of the Ferraris and he chopped down on me and I couldn't avoid him and I hit his rear fender and uh, been an A-frame. So I'm out of the race. Tough break for Peter Revson. has taken the lead from McLaren. Both cars closely matched in speed, acceleration out of turns, and braking. 
The new McLaren team cars have dominated the Can-Am series. Dennis Hall won the first three races and McLaren the fourth. The other McLaren cars, vintage models compared to the Mark III's, the Lola's and Hall Chaparral have been playing a catch-up game through these early races, but at Riverside have finally closed the margin. With a victory here and at the final race in Las Vegas, Hall can at least tie home for the series championship. But McLaren can win all the marbles with a good showing at Riverside. playing a part in it. At this point in the race, there's only one of four Fords remaining. Madam Cornelli Jones in third position. But all eyes are on the seesaw battle for the lead between Jim Hall and the Chaparral and Bruce McLaren in the McLaren car. It's perhaps the finest sports car race of the year. but this time in heavy traffic. McLaren gets caught behind a slower car, but Hall finds room and goes out in front for the second time. Barnelli Jones, now more than half a lap behind, is still third. Donahue's seconds behind in fourth. John Surtees is out of the race at the 50 lap mark. McCluskey goes in also. Reporter Reconomaki is with Surtees. Let's check in. A bad day, eh, John? Yeah, it's not too good. What's the trouble with the machinery? Well, it's overheating a little, but uh, what stopped it is a crown one opinion, I think. McLaren is showing great straightaway speed, slipstreaming Hall and getting by again to lead the Chaparral through turn nine. With just a few laps remaining in the 62 lap 200 mile event, Hall will have to pour it on. Lothenbacher is pushing the number 11 Lola into the pits with a dead engine. Lothar was running fifth and a lap behind the leader. Mike Spence moves up one position with Mosenbacher out. E2, one lap down. George Palmer and Charlie Hayes are running sixth and seventh, two laps behind the leaders. Mark Donahue has overtaken Jones. The Bignotti Lola suffered fuel evaporation problems at Monterey, and our guess is that same problem drained power from the Indy engine today. McLaren has stretched his lead by seven seconds over Hall. He's on the last lap and has really turned it on. McLaren has led 48 of the 62 laps, each lap posting a new record for average speed. A brilliant victory for the New Zealander, his second in a row. A jubilant McLaren crew displays satisfaction in the continuing dominance of Team McLaren. In a moment, victory lane. Bruce McLaren has won the Times Grand Prix at Riverside, California at record speed, 114.405 miles per hour, holding off Jim Hall in a race-long seesaw duel to win by a few scant seconds. Let's join the crowd in victory lane. Congratulations, Bruce. What a day, huh? Thank you very much. Yes. What about the battle with Jim Hall? Was it a surprise when he came by you the first time? It did surprise me that he was hanging in there so tight. Um, I didn't have very much left. And I, I didn't want to go absolutely all it would go the whole race, so I thought I'd wait till the last 10 laps and then see what happened. 
What about the dust and the conditions on the track? How were they, Bruce? That was very bad for a while, but I was glad to see someone out there with a watering truck to uh, keep the dust down. That was a big help. Was there any point on the track where your car had a specific advantage over the others? Um, right in the middle of the slow turns, it's a little bit better, but uh, Jim had me beaten on acceleration and uh, almost a little bit beaten on top speed. They were, we were pretty equal. A great victory and congratulations. Thank you. Bruce McLaren, the victor, and Jim Hall for the second year in a row in second position. Mark Donahue moves into third place with Pennelly Jones, the only Ford driver to finish fourth. Mike Spence took fifth, and George Palmer sixth. McLaren's share of the purse is close to $24,000. His victory here vaults him into the lead in the Can-Am Cup race with 30 points. Next stop, Las Vegas. Times Grand Prix at Riverside, California has been brought to you by Fram Corporation, maker of the finest in oil, air, and fuel filters.